Hey, this is Nikki with One Life Anywhere, and this is our student experience. So every week we kick it off with an icebreaker. Um, this week's icebreaker is gonna be really fun, but it's gonna take a little bit of explaining. So, the goal of this week's activity is to make a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. Sounds easy enough. If you have a host of your watch party, your host is gonna need to go and find peanut butter, jelly, and bread for this activity and utensils. You might want some utensils as well. If you do not have a designated host, take this time to pick someone, make them your host because they're going to be the sandwich maker. Now, for those of you who are not making the sandwich, you are going to be in charge of giving very specific directions on how to make a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. It sounds very easy, but host, please make sure that you are following their directions to a T. If they do not tell you to do something, don't do it. Whatever they tell you to do, do it exactly the way they said it so that you make sure that however the sandwich ends up, you followed the directions. You get what I'm saying? Okay, if you are not in a group, um, if you're watching this by yourself, um, then we do have a little social media engagement for you. Jump out on social media platforms, whichever one you like, and start a debate what's better, grape jelly or strawberry jelly for a PB&J.
All right, so hopefully your sandwiches turned out okay, um, but if they didn't, maybe you guys can discuss later whose fault it was. Was it the sandwich maker or the instruction givers? Why did the sandwich fail? So last week we looked into uh, the big question was how does God begin to fulfill his promises? And we looked at the promises that he made to Abraham and how he had started to play that out in Abraham's life and started to call him to bring glory to him through the world. And so this week's big question that we're going to dive into a little bit more, did God's promise to Abraham fail because of Israel's disobedience? We're going to watch a video together to look into why God's promises to Abraham failed. If you've been around Christians, you've probably heard of the idea of having a personal relationship with God, which could mean different things in the Bible, like having God as a friend, or your father, or maybe your teacher. But there's one particular way that the Bible talks about this relationship that you find all over. But strangely, we don't talk about it that much. And that's the idea of a partnership with God. A partnership like working alongside someone to accomplish a goal together. Right. And this is actually what you see at the beginning of the Bible. God creates this good world full of all of this potential. And then God appoints these unique creatures, humans, as his partners in bringing more and more goodness out of all that potential. But the humans don't want to partner with God. They rebel and try to create a world on their own terms. And so this broken partnership is the Bible's explanation for why we're stuck in a world of corruption and injustice and the tragedy of death. It's not like there's just one or two humans who have bailed on this relationship. In the story of the Bible, everyone has abandoned the partnership with God. So what God does is select a smaller group of people out of the many, and he makes a new partnership with them called a covenant. And in a covenant, God makes promises and then in exchange asks his partner to fulfill certain commitments. And the purpose of all of this is to somehow use this covenant relationship to renew his partnership with everybody else. Now, there are actually four times in the Old Testament that we're told God initiates a covenant relationship with Noah, Abraham, the nation of Israel, and King David. And it's through these that God is forming a covenant family into which all people will eventually be invited. So let's see how these work. The first one is with Noah. So in this story, God has just brought the flood to cleanse the world of humanity's corruption. And Noah and his family are the only ones left. And so God makes a covenant with Noah saying, listen, I know that humans will continue to be evil, but despite that, I'm not going to destroy it like this again. Instead, the earth will be this reliable place for us to work together. Great. So what does Noah have to do? Nothing. And that's what's so interesting about this first covenant is that God is promising to be faithful even though he knows humans won't be. The next time we see God make a covenant is with a man named Abraham. God chooses him promises to bless him, give him a large family, lots of land where they can flourish. And in return, God asks Abraham to trust him and train up his family to do what is right and just. And the whole reason for this covenant is God says that somehow he's going to bring his blessing to all families of the world through this one family. So that's Abraham. The next time we see God make a covenant is when Abraham's family grows into the tribe of Israel. And this covenant is with the whole tribe. God asks them to obey a set of laws, which are these guidelines for living well as a community of God's partners. And if they do this, then God promises to bless them and that they will become a people who then represent him to the rest of humanity. That's the covenant with Israel. The last covenant is with King David. Yeah, the tribe of Israel has become this large nation ruled by David. And God asked David and his descendants to partner with him by leading Israel in obeying the laws and doing what is right and just. And God promises that one day, one of David's sons will come and extend God's kingdom of peace and blessing over all the nations. So those are the four covenants that God makes in order to restore his partnership with the whole world. But here's what happens. Israel breaks the covenant. They worship other gods, they allow horrible injustice, and so they lose their land and are forced off into exile. So it seems hopeless. But during this time, Israel's prophets talked about a day when God would restore these covenants in spite of Israel's failure. 
somehow. Yeah, they called it the new covenant. And this is actually what's so interesting about Jesus is that he's introduced into this story as the one who fulfills all of these covenant relationships. We're told that he's from the family of Abraham, and so he will bring the blessings of that family to the whole world. We're told that he's the faithful Israelite who was able to truly obey the law. And we're told that he's the king from the line of David, and so he goes about extending God's kingdom of justice and peace to all. And that's really remarkable for one guy. Yeah, and what it highlights is perhaps the most surprising claim of all made about this man, that Jesus is no mere human, but rather God become human. And God did this in order to be that faithful covenant partner that we are all made to be, but have failed to be. And so through Jesus, God has opened up a way for anyone to be in a renewed partnership with him. So Jesus calls people to follow him and become part of this new covenant family. And despite their failures, Jesus is committed to making them into partners who were becoming more and more faithful. The story of the Bible ends with a vision of a fully renewed world, full of goodness and peace. And there's this renewed humanity there, partnering together with God to expand the goodness of his creation. And so the end of the Bible story is really a new beginning. All right, so we have some video discussion questions. If you are in a small group, please take some time um, to break out into a small group and discuss these questions about the video. If you are watching this by yourself, um, take a minute to um, go through these questions on your own, reflect on them, even journal, or toss them out on social media and have a discussion as well. Those questions are gonna be up on your screen. The first one, what is God's role in a covenant? The second question, what is man's role in a covenant? The third question there, what did God do when Israel failed to keep the covenant? And the last question, how are we able to be partners with God? So this is the time where we're going to dig deeper into scripture, looking at our big question and going to scripture for the answer to that big question. And we're going to do something a little different this week. I'm going to read the scripture um, for you, and then we're going to have a moment um, to discuss a question pertaining to that specific scripture. And then we'll come back to the next scripture. So there's three scriptures um, in this week's lesson um, and questions to go along with each scripture. So at the end of each scripture, there will be a question up on the screen, and you'll have a moment to pause and discuss that question. So we're going to start in Deuteronomy. Uh, Chapter 30, verses 1 through 3 and verse 6 says, In the future, when you experience all these blessings and curses I have listed for you, and when you are living among the nations to which the Lord your God has exiled you, take to heart all these instructions. If at that time you and your children return to the Lord your God, and if you obey with all your heart and all your soul and all the commands I have given to you today, Then the Lord your God will restore your fortunes. He will have mercy on you and gather you back from all the nations where he has scattered you. The Lord your God will change your heart and the hearts of all your descendants so that you will love him with all your heart and soul and so you may live. The question on your screen says, what does Deuteronomy 30 mean when it says that God will change your heart? The next scripture is from the book of Jeremiah, chapter 31, verses 31 through 33. It says, The day is coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel and Judah. 
This covenant will not be like the one I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand and brought them out of Egypt. They broke that covenant. Though I love them as a husband loves his wife, says the Lord. But this is the new covenant I will make with the people of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my instructions deep within them, and I will write them on their hearts. I will be their God, and they will be my people. So in this verse um, in Jeremiah, what does God promise to do for his people in the new covenant? We're going to look in the book of Ezekiel, chapter 36, verses 24 through 27. For I will gather you up from all the nations and bring you home again to your land. Then I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you will be clean. Your filth will be washed away, and you will no longer worship idols. And I will give you a new heart, and I will put a new spirit in you. I will take out your stony, stubborn heart and give you a tender, responsive heart and I will put my spirit in you so that you will follow my decrees and be careful to obey my regulations so there what do you think Ezekiel 36 means when it says that God will give them a tender and responsive heart and a new spirit As we look through these scriptures, despite the fact that Israel time and time again broke the covenant, God remains faithful. The last question here is going to come up on your screen to discuss, and I want you to look at what are some common themes that you're seeing in God's promises that we've looked at so far? Remember back to our icebreaker, um, we were building those sandwiches and I asked you to um, kind of debate, did your sandwich fail because of the sandwich maker or did your sandwich fail because of the instructions? Our big question was, did God's promise to Abraham fail because of Israel's disobedience? The answer to that, no. God is faithful to his covenant even when humanity is faithless. God promised to rescue his people forgive their sins, and restore his world by sending the promised Savior called the Messiah. So God keeps involving us in this plan. Humanity, no matter how many times we break the covenant or we mess up, he still keeps us involved. I want to challenge you guys to memorize um, Ezekiel 36, verse 26, um, where it says that God is going to take out that stony, stubborn heart and replace it with a tender and responsive one. I want to challenge you to remember that so that you can think through when you have a stony and stubborn heart um, and if it's God trying to replace it with one of tenderness and responsiveness to him. This week's application questions are going to be up on your screen for discussion. And so those are, how might your life look different if you ask God to give you a new heart and spirit and he granted you that request? The next question, which of God's promises is most meaningful to you and why? And the last one, what motivates you to obey God and why? Right now we're moving into a time of worship and here at One Life we worship extravagantly because we believe that worship is a response to the person, the person of Jesus. It comes out of that tender and responsive heart that God has replaced in us in place of that stony and stubborn heart. And so at this time, I'd love for you to join us in this time of worship, whatever that looks like for you, if it's standing and singing along, or if it's um, sitting and just quietly contemplating the words of the songs, please join us in this time of worship.
My name is Michael Karen, and I'm one of the worship leaders here at One Life. Um, I know we've got people that are watching from our one, of our one of our campuses. Maybe you're watching from online at a watch party, One Life Anywhere, Facebook, all the different places that we have online. But then we also have people that are here at our broadcast campus on the east side of Evansville. And um, I know for a lot of us, this has been a week. <laughs> um, and I know that's been acknowledged probably ad nauseum. Um, but I think really what I want to encourage and challenge myself and all of us to do this morning is um, to bring all of the stuff that we're carrying, whether it's excitement or fear, um, frustration, elation, whatever those things are. I guess I want all of us to just bring those things this morning in our arms and set those in a, as an offering um, before our God. We're going to go into our, our opening song. It's called Unstoppable God. And this song for me, I know we've done it a lot here at One Life, but this song for me is a pillar of, of strength when I need courage. I look to these types of things. I look to the scriptures that, that infuse songs like this. Um, and I, I, really, that's what I want us to do this morning, is I want us to sing about the timeless things of God that don't change, regardless what happens in culture, what, regardless of what happens around us. So if you're at one of our campuses, I want to just go ahead and encourage you to stand, and we're going to worship this morning.
just want to take a moment and behold the beauty of the Lord. We want to take a moment and, and comb through. Those of us that have known you for a while, we want to comb through the experiences that have shaped who we are and how incredible and how irreplaceable and how invaluable those experiences are. Father, we want to behold the beauty of the Lord that we see all around us, the unchanging nature of God. the things about you that are trustworthy, that we can count on, the things that are our rock. God, we trust you. And we don't just trust you to take care of us, God. We trust you to take care of a world that needs you, that is crying out in so many different ways. Father, we, we, we look at you, the author, the finisher, the perfecter of our faith. Amen.
truth when I can't find it. Light up this broken heart and light me to a time on earth is done. Oh, Holy Spirit, within me. Helplessness before you. And so anything that we have to offer, whether it's our worship or our time or our attention, or if it's something as big as our lives and our families, God, I pray that you would speak to us during this critical hour as a church, as a nation, as a world. And please give us wisdom. Father, we love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.